you know, martial arts training can morph. You don't always end up training for the same reasons as you started. Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 416. And today, my guest is Crew Christopher Ballard. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, your host on the show, the founder at Whistlekick, martial artist at large. Oh, I should, I just made that up. I should put that on my business card. <laughs> I love the martial arts. I love everything about it. I love the people I get to meet. I love the training. I love the way it makes me better physically, mentally. Martial arts is just awesome. And that's why I've dedicated my life to advancing the martial arts through Whistlekick. If you want to find out more about what we're doing to move the martial arts forward, to help it gain its rightful place at the top of the pursuit, hobby, sport pyramid, I don't know if it's a pyramid, but it's a good enough analogy as any, right? You can head on over to whistlekick.com. You're going to find a whole bunch of stuff over there. You're going to find the products that we make, and you can use the code podcast15 to save 15% on any of them. You'll find links to other projects that we're involved in. You'll find a blog. You'll find links to our social media. You'll find a sign up for a newsletter that we send out like a couple times a month just to keep you up to date on what's going on. Maybe drop a discount in there. There's some original content that goes out in that newsletter. And if you head to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you're going to find show notes for this and every other episode of this show. Transcripts, videos, photos, links. We have everything arranged chronologically as well as by style, by location. So if you want to dig in and maybe find some episodes that you've missed or want to find out who's close to you, you can do that right there. But let's talk about today's guest. If you've been listening for more than a little while, you know I live in Vermont. Whistlekick is based in Vermont. I've been here since college. And it's a great place. But there aren't a whole lot of people. And so when you start to dig into the martial arts in Vermont, It's kind of a small group. There are plenty of people participating, but most people aren't that far separated. Instead of six degrees of separation, maybe we're talking about two. And that's why it's been so funny that I've heard of and known of our guest today for years, but yet our paths never crossed. Well, it took a mutual friend reaching out and saying, Look, it's time. You have to talk to this guy to make it happen. So, we did. It's a wonderful conversation. We did it over audio just to make everything easier logistically, but I have no doubt that I'll be getting together with this guy soon. Maybe we'll even do some video. Who knows? So I'd like to welcome Crew Ballard to the show. Crew Ballard, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for having me on. It's great to have you on. Now, now at some point, we're going to have to remedy this, but we actually haven't met in person. And Listeners might be hearing that saying, okay, no big deal, Jeremy. You talk to people all the time. Um, You are, I'm going to say, no more than 45 minutes away right now. (laughs) Very close. Your your school is about 35 to 40 minutes away, depending on traffic. I I know where it is. I've known of you for years, and it took a mutual friend, uh, thanks, Rex, for (laughs) introducing us and and making this happen. So I'm excited. Me too, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Vermont is one of those states that, you know, we just, we have these pockets of things that, you know, people can, can be doing something for decades in this, this little corner. And, and if you're not living in that corner, you don't know about it. In fact, uh, once in a while, I, I learn of a, a martial arts school that I, I, I thought I knew of them all, I th- especially <laughs> in Northern, you know, Northern to Central Vermont, there aren't a whole lot of people. So I thought I knew all the schools and it was like six months ago. Somebody said, Oh, do you know this guy? And I went, no. So it's funny how we, we just kind of all coexist, but don't always know each other. This is true. Very true. Well, I'm, I'm happy for the opportunity to get to know you better and, and you know, listeners get to come along for the ride, whether or not they like it or not. Honestly, I don't care because I'm going to enjoy our conversation. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm very happy to be on the show. Very glad to connect. Good, good. Well, well thank you. And I appreciate, I appreciate your time. And, you know, let's, let's just... Let's start. Let's start in the way that we always start. It's the, it's the fundamental way. It's the white belt of questions. And that is, how did you find martial arts? Excellent question. Um, I actually had a pretty rough upbringing, believe it or not. And my mom was the first person to ever 
suggest me doing something um, in the contact sports or martial arts realm. And it just so happened that she had moved to Kennedy Drive in South Burlington. And there was a very, very small dojang that had opened up called Prime Time Taekwondo. I believe this was 1984, maybe 85, um, quite a long time ago. Um, and that's kind of how it started for me was going in there. Um, and then from there, meeting other local martial arts instructors as I kind of progressed um, in age, um, bounced around to almost all of the local Taekwondo studios in the Chittenden County area. <laughs> um, and yeah, just never stopped. And 35 years later, you know, here we are. Yeah. Yeah. Now, of course, I introduced you with a title that, you know, really doesn't fit with Taekwondo. So obviously some things happen in there. You start with Taekwondo and anyone who knows Northern to central Vermont, you know, Taekwondo is pretty heavy here. We've got a lot of Taekwondo presence, not a ton of other things. So was that part of it? Were you reaching out looking for other things or, you know, what's that story look like? So basically I had started there. Um, that was my route. Um, I'd met, you know, Master Vitals, Marshkey, Robenstein, Donnelly, Charlie Farmer, like all, all these, you know, great Taekwondo practitioners, um, Stan and Albert Rosario, way out in Hardwick even. Um, and at some point, probably around, I don't know, I guess I'd say 18, I, I really wanted to make the jump from, you know, point fighting and, and semi-contact, what have you, style of fighting to a more full contact style of fighting. Um, Unfortunately, as you know, being in a really small area, there wasn't a whole lot to choose from outside of the traditional realms. Um, so I ended up driving up to TriStar Gym in Montreal from 1999 till about 2003. Um, and I met the guys at TriStar and they were a gym that specialized in kickboxing, Thai boxing and mixed martial arts. Um, so that's really where that fraction for me happened. Um, and it just grew out of partially wanting something different, wanting to expand my own, you know, base, but the, com the competing was really big to me at that time. And I really wanted to go that route with it. Now, Burlington to Montreal, it's not a long drive, but it's not a short drive either. You know, so wh what, what was it about the idea of, of full contact or, or something beyond point and, you know, partial contact fighting that you were that, interested that invested you were going to make that hike for four years well it started with watching videos of early kickboxing um like benny the jet uh joe lewis stuff like that um and then i i actually found thai boxing and i started watching a lot of the old golden era you know 1970s 1980s uh, thai boxing matches that took place in thailand and i just thought to myself man if, if i'm gonna do something that's gonna be full contact and you know, I'm going to do something like this. And then, of course, the realization was there's nothing like this around me. Uh, <laughs> kind of sunk in. So that's kind of what prompted the driving. Mm. Um, and I was more than happy to, to make the drive up there because uh, I fell in love with the coaching staff in the gym pretty much immediately when I got there. Um, even though I couldn't get there as much as I wanted to, I would still get up there twice a week, basically. Uh, and it just really sparked my interest. And I fell in love with Muay Thai from there, learned more and more about it. Um, and that's what prompted me eventually to start traveling to Thailand to train. Wow. wow. Now, you said you started this, this journey into Muay Thai at 18. I'm going to assume at some point in there you took a fight? Yeah, yeah. Um, I fought how, for how quickly from, from the start of that training did you start fighting? Oh God. It was, I think it was that same year, to be honest with you. I think I took my first match in 99 or right around 99. Um, and I fought for the United States kickboxing association, which is defunct. Now it actually the guy that used to own it, Paul Rosner passed away. Um, and I also did some matches under the IKF banner international kickboxing federation. And I did some smoker events and amateur events as well. Um, nothing to really brag about. I never won a championship. Um, but I did it and I loved it. <laughs> so, you know, like anything else, it becomes kind of addicting. Uh, and the more I train, the more I love it. And then, you know, the fighting was just kind of the apple on top or the cherry on top rather, because it was the style of fighting that I really wanted to experience and get some, you know, get some history in. And I, up until then, all of my 
competition experience had basically been point and Olympic style Taekwondo fighting. So again, it was just, it was really the initial thing when I was an 18 year old was, wow, this is just different. This looks interesting. And it just kind of captivated me. Hmm. What was it about your Taekwondo background that both helped and hindered your time in Muay Thai? It's a good one. Um, I think the distance and the timing and obviously the kicking um, and the cardio that came along with it, those were the physical things. Um, you know, when you strip martial arts down into tenets or into basic principles, I think the indomitable spirit uh, really helped, you know, as a kid doing pushups and sit-ups and flutter kicks and being told, you know, don't quit. That really transitioned over when it was uh, a little more aggressive training and a little more real was that don't quit mentality, indomitable spirit, you know, never give up. And And how about the other side of that coin? What what did you find you were set behind in maybe some some habits, some patterns from your Taekwondo time, to, things you had to unlearn? Believe it or not, and this sounds contradictory to a lot of what we learn as martial artists, but being on the balls of my feet a little too much, <laughs> being uh, side-facing or bladed in my stance, um, not having a huge repertoire at the time of boxing techniques, um, and also the the format of the point fighting, you know, some some tournaments will limit contact to the open face. Uh, most will not allow contact with anything like a a knee or an elbow or a leg kick. So some of the rule sets that I was learning and applying back then weren't necessarily great for the new rule set I was walking into. But I think there was enough good stuff, um, both mentally, physically, spiritually, that I gained from doing traditional martial arts that helped me go into the kickboxing. Hmm. I, I could see that. All right. And so here you are. I mean, we've gotten up to 2003. You're training in Montreal, Muay Thai. You're, you're, you're taking some fights, some matches. And where does the journey go from there? Um, believe it or not, it goes straight into the military. <laughs> Okay. Um, that, that's a transition I wouldn't have expected. Yeah. So, you know, one minute I'm in TriStar and I'm in a place that's up and coming and there's people like GSP and David Luazo and a slew of other fighters that are going to go on and become basically legends in, the, in their respective sports. Um, but I had always wanted to be in the military and I had a short stint in the Navy <laughs> fresh out of high school, but we had a loss in the family. My gram had passed away and they let, a, let me come home on a hardship discharge. Um, and I re-enlisted while I was home into the National Guard because I either had to go back into the Navy to finish out my training or I had to join one of the other service branches. So in between all of this training and fighting and everything else, um, joining the military became like this thing I really, really, really wanted to do. And the National Guard kind of fit the bill because I knew if I did that, I might have time still to schedule my own you know martial arts training in between not being active was kind of the uh was the appealing thing because i knew i would deploy but the in between times i knew i would have time to train basically hmm. so as you're as you're looking at this you know as you're you're dealing with this military career martial arts is still a priority and not just a small priority it sounds like Still a priority. In fact, as soon as we, uh, I, I did get into the National Guard in 2003 and I joined the uh, medevac unit, uh, the dust off unit here in Vermont. And as soon as we were mobilized to deploy to Iraq, I wanted to really become the unit trainer for the combatives program that the army was running. Mm. So I mean, literally, even in training to prepare to deploy, I still had the martial arts bug. It was still, you know, heavy on my mind. A lot of times when we get people on the show, you know, it's pretty clear that martial arts is filling this this hole, you know, whether you want to think of it as a puzzle piece or, you know, just something quite often lacking in what they had or, or maybe something in their upbringing. Does that resonate for you? Did martial arts fill some kind of hole? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it I think it filled the general hole of sport. Number one, it was something that it was an activity that I had to be physical and I wasn't really a football player or baseball, basketball, you know, kind of your traditional sport athlete. 
Um, so when I was younger, it was a sport. As I got older, I think it became more of a, almost more of a spiritual thing. As time went on, it got less and less about the physical training, as, as I'm sure you and other martial artists know. Um, you know, martial arts training can morph. You don't always end up training for the same reasons as you started. Um, mm. So, yeah, that's kind of where it took me, I think. Okay, I can see that. Makes a lot of sense. I th- I think for a lot of us, as you said, martial arts becomes that sport that clicks for us in a way that basketball and football and, and you know, whatever else never really did. And, and, you know, I can't speak for you, but I know for a lot of listeners that I've heard from, from myself personally, I was able to correlate my effort with my results in a way that I wasn't always able to with team sports. You know, I could really like work my butt off, you know, at, let's say basketball, you know, I make my shot better, dribble better, pass better. But if the other people on the team weren't better, none of us were better. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. It was like, it was like an individual, an individual sport. Um, and it really makes you draw internally after a while. I think a lot of people will come to it for, you know, sport or weight loss or self-defense or what have you. And the longer you train, the more I find the people that have trained the longest, it, it really truly becomes part of their life. It's not just something they do anymore. Uh, I tell my wife all the time, it's more like brushing my teeth. It's so ingrained in what I do now. That's just what it is. <laughs> that is an analogy I have not heard before. I like it. I like that a lot. Now I gotta go. I gotta go back for a quick second. Um, you know, one of the things that I do when when I talk to people on this show is I try to put myself in the position of the listeners. And every once in a while, I get this this kind of imaginary voice in the back of my head saying, "No, go back and ask him about that." So sure. it sounded like you said that you trained at the same gym as George St. Pierre when he was coming up. Is, did I hear that right? Uh, yeah, George was there. Uh, okay. They're different. They're different training times for all sure. the different programs. But I would see him in the gym. Um, David Loasso, he was known as the Crow, used to yeah. train out of the gym too. Yeah, heard that name. Um, and they, they had a tremendous amount of of kickboxers. Uh, Conrad Pla was actually the owner before Faraz Zahabi, which who everybody knows now. Um, Conrad Pla was an ISKA world kickboxing champion back in his time too, and he actually fought Javier Mendez from AKA. <laughs> Uh, so even the current gyms have older gyms and the current owners have older owners, but uh, yeah, it was, it was a really amazing place, you know, to be and train and just be inspired, uh, especially for a young guy, you know, just coming up and looking to get his feet wet with it. So I have to admit when you were talking about making a, you know, multi-hour drive multiple times per week for years, there was part of me going, okay, why? There's something, there's something I'm not understanding in what you've said. And now I feel like I'm getting it because of the people who were there and what I would imagine the caliber of the instruction and the, what I'm going to guess the passion of the other people training, probably pretty magnetic. It was amazing. Um, it was definitely magnetic and that's the word I would definitely use to describe it. Um, you know, you go into a lot of gyms that, that maybe don't have that caliber of athlete or coach or whatever it is that makes it special. Um, and you can learn a variety of things from that gym and you can be satisfied with it. But on some level, being in that other space where some of the best in the world are really did make a difference. It really made me want to make that drive. It really wanted to make me push and say, OK, you know, I could just do local stuff, but let's let's, you know, get out of the comfort zone here. But it was a big commitment for a young kid. I remember, I remember telling my parents sometimes they'd call and be like, "Hey, where are you?" I'm like, "Oh, I'm headed back up, you know, to Canada." They're like, "My God, you must be racking up so many miles on your car, you know, that type of stuff." <laughs> but well worth it. Well worth it when I look back. Mm. One of the things I always like to ask the guests about are the stories that they've picked up along the way. You know, we learn skills, we learn, you know, various styles. We add maybe some some belt rank, maybe some bruises or broken bones, but through it all, there are stories. So if I was to ask you for your favorite story from any point in time in your training, what would that be? It would probably have to be in 2007, I went on my first trip to Thailand and I was training the entire time I was there. And it was a really serious atmosphere. 
you know, everybody got up in the morning really early and ran a five or 10 mile jog um, before two different training sessions that lasted between six and eight hours total. And I, I really think that that was probably the best memory I had of training in general. The coaches were so funny that we went out one night toward the end to a country Western bar that was sung in the Thai language. And it was absolutely hysterical to see these rock men, you know, these guys that just train, condition their body. They fight every single weekend for years on end, singing country Western, you know, karaoke style out at a, you know, a local spot. Um, it, it just really, it stuck with me. We were just, you know, eating bad food and doing all the things wrong that you shouldn't be doing while you're training like that. And the coaches were pretty much right there along with us. And it was just, it was kind of hilarious to me and that's always stuck with me. Now, when we, anybody that knows anything about Muay Thai, I mean, if you've seen the fights, it's intense and they start them young. I mean, it, it's, it's almost this factory. And I don't mean that in, in a negative way, but just there, there are a lot of volume. There are a lot of people training Muay Thai coming up, starting at some of these schools, you know, preteen. And as you said, training weekend after weekend, whereas here, in the U.S., we're used to a full contact fight, you know, six, eight, 12 weeks. You know, there's quite a bit of time in between. But these guys are staying at the top of their game and somehow finding ways to recover. Is that other side of the coin, that letting go, that country western bar, and, you know, I assume the partying that's going along with it, is that a typical part of that experience for them to kind of decompress? Um, I think a lot of those guys do and because there it's just a totally different culture. Like a lot of the kids, like you said, are, are orphaned or they would be had they not found uh, a Thai gym and they get taken in and they get medical attention, schooling, you know, all, all the benefits that come along with being part of the camp are extended to the younger athletes. And I think by the time they're, I would say probably 25, 26, like the majority of the stadium fighters are retired. Not all of them, like some of them, like Sanchai, Bukow, uh, Yodson, Klai, they go on and fight into their 40s. Um, but the vast majority of them retire young. And my feeling on that was, you know, they don't fight. A lot of the trainers themselves don't fight in the stadiums anymore. So I think they do decompress maybe more as they get older. I mean, you certainly don't see the younger kids out <laughs> doing much other than training. Um, but the older, the older coaches definitely... Uh, tend to decompress because I think just the lifestyle has been so hard on their bodies and their spirits <laughs> mm. for so many years that it's good sometimes to just, like you said, you know, go on that other side of the coin for a little bit, just for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. I, I once heard a statistic and I have no idea if it's true that the average pro career for a TIE fighter is about two years, which we can look at and say, well, you know, that's, that's really short, but how many fights are happening in that two year span? You know, that that's, that's a 10, 20, 30 year career for quite a few other combat sports. Sure. Absolutely. And, and I would believe that. I mean, sometimes the kids will start as young as four or five years old, which I know people have mixed feelings about. I myself have you know, mixed feelings about that, to be perfectly frank with you. Um, but yeah, by the time, even by the time they're 19 or 20, you can imagine if they're being brought to the, the stadiums every single weekend from the time they're four or five until they're 18, 20 years old. It's kind of crazy the amount of fights they rack up. It's just phenomenal. Yeah. Now at some point in this journey, you started teaching. So what, what caused you to flip that switch? Um, actually it was, I was injured during my tour in Iraq. Um, and it took a couple of years of being home to figure that out medically. Once we did, um, I kind of realized that I wasn't going to be flying around in helicopters anymore. And, you know, loading patients in and out and stuff like that. So my wife said, Hey, you know, you've always really loved martial arts and why don't you consider, you know, teaching locally, just teaching. Hmm. So that's kind of what sparked that. Um, and up until then I had a desk job. I worked at Vermont federal credit union as a member service rep for like six years on and off in between all the deployments and all the trainings and everything else that was going on. So it just seemed like a really good time <clears throat> to kind of switch gears again, which was weird because originally, you know, fighting was on the menu and then the military became the top priority. And then it kind of turned back to teaching. 
So it's been a weird roller coaster, honestly. Hmm. Wow. And so here you're, you're still teaching, right? You've got a school and what's that experience been like it, you know, the way you just talked about it, you know, let, let me, let me pull back. Let me say, let me ask this question a little bit differently. Quite often the folks that we have on the show teaching has been this kind of natural progression in their training. It's something that at some point along the way, they said, you know, I, I really want to do that. It's something that they were passionate about. But it sounds like your transition into teaching may not have been so, we'll say, preordained, that it was an effort for you to keep going with martial arts, but also to, you know, find a, a job. You know, and I, I don't, I don't ask this question in a, in a, I'm not trying to belittle your experience, yeah. but it sounds like it might be a little bit different than what, what many of us have heard in, in past episodes. So I, I'm, I'm thinking there might be some, some stuff to unpack there. There's more backstory to that. Um, being injured from the military also comes with um, benefits or not. Um, so <clears throat> once I was extended benefits by the military, money wasn't really the driving factor. Mm. It was more, what are we going to do now? Like, what do you want to do now? And my wife said, well, you've always, you know, loved martial arts. So why don't you try your hand at teaching? <clears throat> so it's kind of been like a labor of love. My best friend was Glenn Dufresne. He passed away. He was a martial artist here, uh, fourth on TKD type. And he actually originally started teaching with me. He ran our Shelburne school and I ran my South Burlington school. So that's kind of the... The gist of that it wasn't really for profit. It wasn't really for career. It was more, what are you going to focus your life to doing? Some people want to be, you know, singers, actors, this or that. Like, what, what do you want to do now? But you're right in the fact that I, my path kind of was changed for me almost several times. So it's kind of adjusting, you know, like you, you shoot, move and communicate, but you got to be willing to adjust, improvise, adapt and overcome. So, I mean, three separate lives, if I would have gone down three separate roads, I could see myself being a banker, being a lifelong military member, or being an instructor. And that's really where my passion was. So I think that's why I ended up on the road that I did. Now, you just rattled off a couple of things that I'm guessing came from your military training. Probably. <laughs> yeah. The, the, um, you went through the, you, you sped up when you said them, so they didn't, they didn't hit quite as well. So uh, communicate, adapt, overcome, communicate. Was that? Yeah. Uh, improvise. Hey, there we adapt, go. And overcome. Yeah. 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 And that, that I assume is military training. Absolutely. Yep. Um, you know, things don't always work out the way they're supposed to quote unquote work out. So you have to be flexible in your approach. And I think that kind of, that was true in me finding my path to teaching. I think we can all imagine how much your martial arts helped you in the military, you know, there, there's some, there's regiment, there's, there's a familiarity with training and training hard and training with other people and working towards goals. But let's, let's go back the other way. So what was it from your military training other than, you know, examples like we just heard, right? Have, having a, a, a quick set of wisdom, you can, you can rattle off and say, okay, yeah, this, this resonates. What did you pull out of your military time that you bring into the way that you teach your students? I, I think that I'm very laid back and that might sound weird saying, well, how did the military accomplish that? Because in the job that I was in, um, like I said, things changed like at the drop of a hat and I really had to be flexible um, with what I thought. So with my students, I'm a little bit lax in the fact of, um, you know, you come into a Thai class and everybody's in shorts and a t-shirts. That could be off-putting for somebody that's used to training with tenants and belts and dobok or, you know. Mm. Um, so I'm a little bit more laid back in my approach, but that comes from, I think, trying to adapt. And times change, uh, people change, but the martial arts, the core of martial arts, I find don't really ever change. It's usually in how the instructor presents it to you. Um, some instructors are very, you know, gruff and and black and white and this is how it is and I, I try my best not to be like that as much as possible what was your upbringing like in terms of that that structure you know was it was it very structured or you know moderately structured you know i'm i'm, I'm curious because I, I suspect there's something there too 
Sure. I mean, I was in traditional martial arts most of my life until I became old enough to go up to Canada. Um, so my experience with it at first was very formal. It was, you know, bowing in. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. That type of stuff. Um, just a, just a core, man, I don't even know how to say it. <laughs> like a core of fundamentals yeah. of martial arts and it, and it extended to all the coaches. Like if I think back to the first four or five, you know, martial arts instructors I had, it was all belts and uniforms and, and rank and file. And that helped me as a kid because I was really lacking that. I think, you know, growing up with one parent and, and whatnot, not having, like you said, a traditional sport to fall back on. So my upbringing in martial arts was very traditional. I, I don't think it was very abnormal. Um, and until I found, until I found Muay Thai and kickboxing, it was very, uh, it was very black and white, I think. Mm. It, it almost sounds like that structure was there until you no longer needed it. Kind of. And, and it's weird. Or... <laughs> Interesting. It's really neat stuff. We've talked about, you know, a few different places you train, a few different instructors. And I'd, I'd love for you to think about who you are as a teacher. I usually ask this question a little differently. I usually ask, you know, for you as a martial artist, who's been the most influential person? But I want to ask about it in terms of how you teach, you know, your, your philosophy, the, the way you run your classes. When you think about all of the people you've learned from, which of those people kind of set the tone the most for your teaching style? I would probably say the first coach that I worked with in Thailand, um, Crew Mac was an older gentleman he was in his late 50s at the time and he was just so laid back and it was very you know very awkward coming from a very traditional martial arts background he um he demanded a lot of work out of you and all the students there but he was very friendly in how he did it um and it was it was almost like you know you can yell and scream and you can demand something from someone or you can smile and nod and and get the same amount of work out of them so he was kind of um, he was kind of interesting to me. He was just a really laid back guy that really, really worked you to the point of exhaustion. And up until then, I hadn't really experienced that. And I think I kind of model myself after him in terms of the fight training and the actual training portion. Um, you know, I, I allow my students if they're five minutes late from work to be five minutes late from work within reason. Uh, stuff like that. Stuff that might not be okay at another facility or. You know, they, hey, coach, I forgot my hand wraps. Do you actually have an extra pair? Yeah, absolutely. You know, because I know I'm going to get that work out of them regardless. Mm. I think I, I think I keyed in on him a little bit. It sounds like it. It sounds like it. Yeah. Now let's kind of flip that question around. If you could train with somebody else, somebody you haven't anywhere in the world, anywhere in time, who would you want to train with? Wow, that's difficult. Um... I mean, the obvious choice would be Bruce Lee. I read all of his books growing up, um, took a lot, a lot of what he was trying to say and <clears throat> really tried to internalize it. Even with the gym, um, we were one of the, well, not the first, definitely not, but one of the first gyms to have such a wide range of coaching staff. Um, that was like, take what's useful from all the arts, wrestling, boxing, Taekwondo, kickboxing, Thai box, like anything, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, any, anything that you can learn value from and learn technique from. So I would have to say him because he really did change the way I thought about martial arts. He changed my perception as a young person about martial arts when I started reading his content. Mm. And I think that's a, an eye opener for a lot of us when we, whether we hear it from, you know, Bruce Lee via his books or one of his interviews, or we hear the concept come from someone else, this idea that martial arts training can and depending on your perspective should be diverse is pretty enlightening now you said that you have multiple disciplines happening at, at your gym you know what, what was that intentional or did people just kind of show up and say i can train this thing that you don't already have and you said yes like how did how did that come to be uh, master dufresne actually told me glenn uh, my best friend before he passed he said you know if we ever teach it should be a place that doesn't just do karate or just taekwondo or just boxing it'd be really cool if we you know 
did more than one thing, but we're limited, you know, by our own experiences. So that would take coaches that are willing to work with other coaches in the same space. That's, that can be difficult. Um, but that's kind of where, that's where it came from. It came from Glenn's suggestion, basically of, Hey, let's call this United fighting arts. Let's, let's broaden what we're doing here. You know what I mean? Let's make a center that if you're just straight, not interested in, in martial arts and your thing is boxing, well, you can do that. Or if you're not a boxer and you're interested in traditional training or whatnot, you can do that. Cause up until then there weren't very many places like that. No. No, and I would argue that even most of the places that claim to be that now, it's still 75 or 80% a single style, the style that the instructor instructors are most familiar with, most comfortable in teaching. And then they Absolutely. kind of they add some other things in. And I don't, I don't mean to disparage that. Everyone approaches martial arts and their training and their instruction in a way that works for them. And that's great. That's the, the beauty of martial arts as far as I'm concerned. But it sounds like from from what you're talking about there's no 75 percent. it's it's a bunch of 15 and 20 percent. yeah absolutely it's a group of coaches that are amazing that have gotten together and and truly share the space um i actually sold the facility to my wife uh, about four or five years ago i had some spinal injuries that i needed to address so i took a step back and i've been uh <clears throat> i've been coaching twice a week ever since then i still go in i do tuesday and thursday nights but as far as you just said, it, it's totally true. Like there's the jujitsu coach there, a wrestling coach, a boxing coach, taekwondo. They and they all share the schedule and share the space, so that it's not dominated by just one. Like you said, a seventy five percent heavy on one style. Now I'm sure that there are time slots that are more desirable than others. So how do how do you handle that? That took a little bit of finagling, and it's yeah. still, it's still an art form. To be honest with you. Um, you know, you got to know your students. And I think a lot of people probably end up coming in because of the diversity. Um, so being really aware of how many people are in what class on what night was kind of Deborah, my wife, Deborah's task um, when hammering out the schedule with all these different coaches and whatnot. But I think she does a good job. And I think we have a really good mix on the class nights and times. Um, but you really have to pay attention to your membership in order to get days and times that work for, you know, 80, 90% of each group. <laughs> yeah. Now you've mentioned a couple of times this, this best friend of yours who passed this man that you opened this business with. Would you be willing to talk a bit more about him? Yeah, absolutely. Because I, um, I, anytime someone loses someone important, especially someone who is on a path with them towards something that they're, they were both passionate about something that you're still passionate about in, in, being martial arts, I suspect that there were probably some lessons learned, and I suspect there's a there's an element of of carrying on the torch of and, and maybe doing some things that you feel he would have wanted that you might talk about. Yeah, I mean, Glenn was a great person. Yeah, he was very into video games of all things. Um, he was an avid competitor. He loved um, sparring, point fighting. He loved breaking. I uh, love blindfolded breaking. That was his big, his big thing. Um, and he was a true uh, martial arts practitioner through and through, uh, even how he conducted himself in his normal life. Um, there have been many times that it would have been very easy to say, okay, you know, we've taught for, I think it's 16 years now, um, you know, and we're good, we're done. But like Glenn definitely wouldn't have wanted that. He looked at the gym and, training as a lifelong process he really didn't look at it as you know i'm gonna get this belt and then i'm gonna stop so for me i've had quite a few times throughout my teaching career when i definitely could have hung up the gloves so to speak but i don't feel like i'm there and i don't really feel like i ever will be there and i really feel like the martial arts is just a part of me and i i think he helped really reinforce that for me mm. It's powerful stuff. And, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that he's gone. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. You know, it, it, martial arts tends to build these, these relationships, these friendships that don't happen often outside of martial arts. There's something to be said for punching your friends in the face 
and saying <laughs> thank you for it, right? It, it builds these relationships that people outside of martial arts, and I'm sure the folks listening, I'm sure you have had this experience where people just don't seem to get it. People outside of training just don't seem to get why we do the things we do the way we do them because it's so foreign to everything else. I think the closest thing I could imagine would be something like football, something where there's that intensity of training and that physical contact that you recognize you're making each other better in doing so. Absolutely. It's like um, iron sharpens iron. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, so, and it's sometimes it's painful, like you said. And, you know, sometimes people are like, what are you doing? But right. It's so right. Worth it. <laughs> it's often painful. And so it builds these bonds. I mean, there are people that I've known through martial arts for, you know, 30, 35 years now. And, you know, I can go years without seeing them and then see them again. And it's like nothing has changed, especially if you train with them again, you know, to step back out on the mats or the floor or whatever, whatever the training surface is, it, it can be, you know, 10, 20 years and you just fall back into step because you have, have that foundation. Really amazing how that works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's anything else like that. I mean, maybe there is, but I'm, I haven't experienced it with anything else. <laughs> You talked a bit about Bruce Lee and his, his books. How about movies? Are you a fan of his movies? Um, I, I liked Enter the Dragon, which is obviously the big commercial one. Um, I liked it because, again, it was, it was, for me, it was seeing all those different, different styles. Uh, you, know, you had Jim Kelly doing his thing. You had Bob Wall in there. You had, all, you had all these amazing old school martial artists doing it a little bit different. They were all out there doing it. Um, but they were doing it different. And even the other day we watched that movie and I was like, the opening scene is Bruce Lee and Sammo Hung and they're wearing modified, well, Kempo gloves, I believe they used to be called, but they're, you know, modified open fingered gloves and they're doing full contact and they're doing stand up and ground and throwing and everything in between. And I just thought about it and I'm like, my God, this was in the you know sixties and seventies. And here we are finally, you know, competing like this in modern MMA today. It really, it really set in how far ahead of his time. Bruce was. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think throughout martial arts, there have been a handful of people who have looked at what everybody around them has been doing and seeing the value in each thing and kind of collecting it. And of course, one of the things that was special about Bruce, not only that he saw that, but that he was exposed to so many different things, you know, not everyone gets the opportunity to travel around the world and train or to you know be around one group of instructors and then you know pop the border to another country and train with another group of instructors of of, of an amazing caliber i mean absolutely wonderful stuff and of course in both cases it's led to some pretty unique outcomes or at least you know I'm, it's what it's sounding like in in your case and and believe me at some point soon i got to i got to pop up and and start training with you guys because sounds like a yeah. great thing you got going anytime sir yeah it's great i mean and, uh, you know training in training in thailand became important to me as i looked around i don't know why i thought of this but i did um so i'm kind of going out there on a limb but please it became important to me because i i saw a lot of you know like you kind of alluded to earlier some places would have a banner outside that says kickboxing or Muay Thai or whatnot, and you'd go in and it, it really wasn't. It was more of a cardio oriented setup. So I began really digging and looking, saying, what makes an instructor in Muay Thai? Where where does that actually come from? Because I see all these people that are, you know, quote unquote coaches or running classes in it, but they don't really have any depth of knowledge to behind it. So it made me start questioning, like, okay, well, where did where does this come from? And that, I think that's what led to all the different trips back and forth to Thailand um, to really get that under control. Like, okay, the Sports Authority and um, the Ministry of Culture are the two big ones that certify, you know, instructors internationally. So I began traveling and I'd ask the gym owners, like, oh, are you through the, the Sports Authority or the Ministry of Culture? You know, and you, you wouldn't always get great responses doing that but I, I liken it to taekwondo like you'd walk into a school and be like are you an itf school or a wtf school you know what i mean <laughs> like, mm, yeah something yeah. similar to that but the more i looked the less and less i found um and then i thought about my traveling back and forth to montreal for all those years 
And I'm like, man, you know, if there's people in this state that really want to train, they're going to have to either, you know, move out of state or they're going to have to be willing to drive like I drove. So for me, having, you know, having that available here in Vermont was a pretty big deal once we got up and running and going back to Thailand. I've been six times now. Um, it's really become more and more important as I get older and I see the way that the art is progressing. And for those folks who haven't been to Thailand to train, which I'm going to assume is the vast majority, and I don't even think the majority of people we have listening have experienced training in Muay Thai. If they were to hop a plane and, and go to Thailand and step into one of these kind of, you know, I, I see a lot of these one to two week residential, you know, learn Muay Thai kind of, kind of programs. And I, I'm guessing you're far beyond that when you go there, but you know, what would, what would the t- typical karateka, taekwondo, kung fu practitioner see that might be different if they go to Thailand? Uh, the work, the work output is I think in the heat are the two first things that you'll notice. Um, you know, it can be, it could be a five or 10 mile run in the morning, like I said, and then six to eight hours of training sessions broke up into morning and afternoon. So three in the morning, three in the evening or four and four respectively. Um, so even if you go for a month and you live in the camp and you're training with 10 to 15 world champions and you're doing eight hours a day, I think that's the the selling point of those types of things. But you really have to go longer than a week or two and you really have to go more frequently than once in your life to really, you know what I mean, to really start learning names of techniques, um, feints history there there's so much to the art that i i didn't even know about you know even though i had trained at tristar and i had fought as a young person by the time i went to thailand i was learning about krabby Krabong, moi baron like all these older styles that muay thai is based on that i had no clue at the time um, so you, you really won't get the full effect but i think for the average u.s or, or european whatnot uh, traditional martial artist that goes the heat and the volume of work are the two biggest uh, changes. Contact can be learned. You, you can learn to, to deal with the contact. Uh, your body, you know, as you know, it gets used to it after a while with proper training. But the heat and the work output are just phenomenal. Nice. So let's kind of flip things. Everything we've talked about has been in the past. So let's look to the future now. Sure. Can you look out over the next 5, 10? I'll let you cast that net as far as you'd like years what do you see for you and your training for your school you know your relationship to the martial arts uh just giving back is the biggest thing my wife started um a free community self-defense program for women um empowerment through self-defense uh we originally picked up hope works with it they have uh, since moved on but we still do the seminars um and we've been doing we do one for multi-gender um just trying as best we can we host the um burlington police department's defensive tactics program out of our facility free of charge we do we really are trying to we're in a we're in a point where we're trying to give back to the community as best we can so if we could keep doing that for another 10 years that would be that would be great with me uh, you know, my biggest thing is that I just have joy in my life from being able to go there and do the one thing it is that I always have really loved to do and share it with other people. So, I mean, hopefully that just continues and doesn't change. Sounds like a pretty exceptional place you've got going there. And, and I suspect there are quite a few people listening who want to form something like that, you know, the, the kind of school that you have. Do you have any advice for them? Yeah. Um, you know, train, (laughs) train and don't ever stop training. Um, no matter what the circumstance is and, uh, whether it's grades or relationship or war or disability, or, you know, if it's something you love to do, you got to keep doing it. And even as a coach, um, I still train all the time as much as my body will let me. Um, I don't ever want to get stagnant in my training. So they, they shouldn't get stagnant in their training too. You know, always be open to new things, always continue to train yourself, because if you're not training, then you don't have anything except memories to pass on of techniques and memories of what you were told before to your students, because you're not actively doing anything anymore. 
So I, I really think training is a huge thing. I think also build bonds, build relationships with other coaches. And that can be really hard because we all, you know, we all have our people, we all have our clan, so to speak, <laughs> at our individual schools. But if I would have never taken the time to build a rapport with the wrestling coach or the boxing guy or the taekwondo coaches or, you know, it just, it would have never been possible. Well said. And I really like that. If you're not actively training, all you have to pass on are memories. Whew. That's powerful. That's powerful stuff. We talk a lot on the show about white belt mentality, this idea that there's always more to learn. And it sounds like you're exemplifying that. And I'm going to guess that the other instructors at your school also feel the same. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's still, I don't think there's anybody coaching that isn't still actively training in some way, shape or form. Oh, that's fantastic. So if people want to find out more about you and your school and what you've got going on, where, where on the web can they go? They can check us out uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, uh, UFAI or United Fighting Arts Institute. Either way, it should pop it up. Um, UFAI.net is the website. They're always more than welcome to come in and check it out. We always do a free week for everybody regardless. So if you want to just come in and check out every single class for a week, you can do that. Uh, nice. Yeah. It's pretty exceptional. And of course, folks, we're going to have links to all the, the social media, the website there at whistlekickmarshalartsradio.com. No need to, to jot notes on your arm while you're driving or whatever else you got going. <laughs> all right. Well, this has been exceptional. And I'd love to ask for one more thing as we kind of fade into the distance. What parting words, what advice would you give to the people listening today? You're stronger than you think you are. Don't let anybody tell you that you're not. And don't ever quit. I don't know what to say other than I had an absolutely wonderful time with this conversation. It's nice to talk to people who have similar outlooks on martial arts. It seemed like Crew Ballard and I clicked in terms of cross training and giving back to the martial arts and in so many other ways. So it was great to finally meet him. And as I said at the top of the show, I really look forward to connecting with him and maybe sharing. Thank you so much, Crew Ballard, for coming on the show today. If you want to find the show notes with transcripts, links, photos, you name it, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the place to go. And whistlekick.com is the place to go to learn more about everything that we do. And if you're headed over there to shop, Podcast 15 gets you 15% off every single thing in the store. New stuff, old stuff, clearance stuff, digital products, uniforms. Yeah, I'll stop naming things. There's a lot there. There are a lot of ways to help us out here at Whistlekick, specifically the show. You can share this episode or another episode. You can let somebody know about the show, maybe nominate someone to be a guest on the show, or head on over to iTunes or Google Podcasts, leave us a review. Those reviews help people find the show. And that's an important part to growing the show. There's a lot of podcasts coming out and it's hard to stand apart. We're doing our best, but your help makes a difference. Our social media is very creative. It's at Whistlekick. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram primarily, but we are also on Twitter and YouTube. My email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com. We keep it easy. I'll see you soon. But until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 